Hello, Global Gardeners. It's great to see everybody today. And I want to thank PD for that moniker. We really are a group of global gardeners. I think that's a, a nice way to term it. We already have Stefan checking in from Romania. Congratulations, you've got snow. I think that's incredible. Jean-Pierre's checked in from France. We have lots of people from all over the United States and all over the world here on a Monday to talk gardening. And so we'll be focusing on your questions, answers popping back and forth. And what a great way to start your gardening week. Just talking about gardening. I think it's great. Let's go ahead and get to a couple of questions that were already popping up today. Uh, Robert Sherwood was wondering, what is better, peat pots or plastic pots for seedlings? And that's a good question because that's one of those things a lot of new gardeners may not understand the difference between plastic pots and peat pots. And it's a little bit different. There are also peat pellets that you can use that are complete peat moss and you can start your seedlings in there. But I'm assuming that you're actually talking about the pots that are made from peat as compared to the pots that are made from plastic. And I'll actually use both. Now, primarily, I'll use plastic pots or yogurt cups or solo cups or whatever I'm, I happen to have at hand that I can recycle. And in most cases, it's plastic. I like using smaller plastic pots because I typically will be transplanting the young seedlings into bigger pots as they grow and then moving them into another area of my grow room under lights or putting them outside to harden off and then transplant in the garden. And so for me, plastic works very well to get the plants and the soil out of the pot for transplanting. It doesn't work so easily with peat pots. In fact, if you use a peat pot, you shouldn't plan to remove the plant and the roots and the soil from the peat pot. What they're really designed to do is to stay as one unit. And so when I use peat pots, I'm using them for plants that don't transplant well. So for instance, cucumbers and squashes and pumpkins don't like being transplanted. They really don't like their roots being disrupted. But if you start those plants in a peat pot and then you take the entire pot and put it into the ground, they'll do much better. And that's the idea. Peat being a material that is organic and will add organic material to the soil. That's the idea behind peat pots is you just plant the whole thing in the ground. Now, for a region like mine that is very dry and the soil tends to stay on the drier side, it takes a long time for those peat pots to break down. And unless you keep the soil evenly moist, it's a barrier to the roots and they might not grow through the pot that you would like you would like. So if you use peat pots, make sure you keep the pot and the soil evenly moist during that entire first two, three, four weeks of growth in the garden, just to make sure that the roots are growing through the peat pots. And then when they get into the, to the soil, um, they'll do fine. So I use peat pots for those kind of plants that don't like roots being disturbed, but I use plastic for everything else. And it's up to you to decide whether you want to, to use both or one. Uh, I think there's advantages either way. If you don't like the idea of using peat, well then, don't use peat pots. There are, 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 there are alternatives out there. You can find the same idea in pots that are made out of um, cow manure. And so it's, it's crazy that you can buy these pots that are made out of other type of organic materials. It doesn't have to be peat, but the concept is exactly the same. You'll be planting the entire pot and the plant in the ground. So good to see everybody here today. I want to give a shout out to Troy Hallman, the newest member of the Gardening Scott channel community as a member. Thanks for joining us, Troy. And I also want to give a shout out to Do Doobie Do Down Down. 
probably didn't know I knew that song, or you knew I knew the song, but I didn't know the tune. So I do. Good to see you, Laura Full, always adding a bit of humor and enjoyment to the morning. In addition to all of our regulars, Jay Dixon and Heidi Clark are here. They're moderators on the channel. Great information between the three of them, Laura Full and Jay and Heidi. And so if you ask a question that I can't get to, chances are they or someone else on the channel will get to the question. So keep throwing them out. Keep checking in. Good to see everybody here today that's checking in. Um, I saw that there's a cold, cold day in North or in northern Florida, Paul. I hope your peppers won't be suffering. I think you're growing all inside at this point, but um, that's cold for northern Florida. And on the opposite side, it's warm in Ely, Nevada. So go figure. You can never know what the winter's going to bring and we'll be talking more about that as we progress because that's the general theme for today's show is gardening during the winter for those of us in the northern hemisphere but for those of you on the other side of the planet feel free to throw your questions out as well and we'll be bouncing back and forth gladys thank you so much good to see you back here on monday i appreciate that contribution that's a nice way to start today thanks so much that's nice and I'll have a drink of tea as your chicken's doing the same. Okay, Belinda saying, thank you, Gardener Scott, for teaching us all so much about gardening since lockdown began. I have not used pellets before and have got some that I look forward to using. Um, I've actually used peat pellets a lot. When I was at the school garden and we were growing thousands of plants each year, uh, that was the easiest way to do it, was just to get a tray of peat pellets pour the water on so they expand and then we would be starting thousands of seeds much easier to do that than to make the soil mix it all up put it in the the, the cells and grow that way but i've done both uh it just for a lot of plants i find the pea pellets work pretty well <clears throat> okay had another question um mks ecoboost was wondering if i had a video about plants that shouldn't be uh put close together and um, I, I kind of have the opposite. So I will have a video coming out here in another couple months talking about companion planting because I understand there's a lot of confusion out there about what plants you can put together and what plants you can't and whether they influence each other and affect the taste. And the, the basic answer is putting plants together really shouldn't affect the flavor of the next plant. If you put plants close together that have different water needs, you might run into a few problems. And so, for instance, um, we put uh, a, a, a daikon, daikon radish that has a really deep root, likes a lot of water, and we're putting that in a bed with um, a, a herb like thyme that doesn't require a lot of water. Well, they're, they're not matched up. And so... If you put as much water as you need for one plant, the other plant might get too much water. And so if we're lightly watering our herbs like the thyme, well, maybe that daikon radish isn't getting all of the water it needs to get down to the depth of that root. So the result will be a harsher tasting radish. And you can draw that same correlation with a lot of other plants. If the plant is not getting all the water and nutrients it needs, the taste of the fruit will be affected because the plant is stressed. So the fruit might not be as sweet. It might be more sour. There might be some of those ramifications. Well, that's not necessarily because of the plant that it's growing next to. It's just because the plants are competing for nutrients or for that water. So you always should try to put plants together that have similar nutrient and water needs. So I do have a video on square foot gardening, and that's the basic concept behind square foot gardening, is you can put lots of different types of plants growing side by side because they're not going to influence the taste of each other. But the, the idea should be that you're choosing the types of plants, typically in a vegetable garden, where they're all going to be watered the same, they're all requiring the same basic soil, They'll all be fertilized the same if it comes time to fertilize, and then you'll have good results. Uh, I, I'm not a huge fan of a lot of the companion planting information that's out there because it's contradictory. You'll have 
someone write a book and say, put these two plants together and don't put these other two plants together. And then you see another book that's just the exact opposite. So there's very little research to help us as home gardeners identify which plants do well together, except for similar needs will give you better success. So I hope that helps out a little bit. And Georgie Porgy was wondering about cucumbers and you had uh, some not happy results I'll say you had both male and female flowers on the the plants but the pollen didn't develop so you didn't get the fruit and you had the same problem with the zucchini and I know the Bay Area had some pretty hot uh, weather this last year and all that smoke as well and that could be an issue so if the plants are stressed and so all the people living in california last year that had all the the fires and all the smoke for days and days if you were growing your garden during that period those conditions that hot air and that smoky air is enough to disrupt the pollen development in the flowers and so if it was just your cucumbers i might say that it was an issue with uh, how you were growing your cucumbers. But you also said you had the same issue with zucchini. So because you had different types of plants all experiencing the same issue with pollen and not setting fruit, it, it's almost always an environmental issue. It's too hot, it's too windy, it's too smoky. There's something in the weather or the environment that's keeping the flowers from pollinating as they should. And so this is a, a great example for uh, garden journals and learning the differences. So if you're growing cucumbers and zucchinis or whatever, and you're not getting pollination, you're not getting the fruit, well, make note of that. And then also make note of the weather, the temperature, the soil moisture levels, all those kind of things. And then that way you can compare in the future that if you have similar problems, you can look back and say, oh yeah, it's been too hot. And so the pollen wasn't able to set. Typically 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and that is about 32 degrees Celsius. When it gets above that temperature, many of the plants we're growing in our garden won't, won't fruit because the pollen development just um, stops. And in, in many cases, the pollen dies. So if it gets too hot in your garden, that could be the reason why you're not getting the fruit that you're expecting. So I also want to give a shout out to MH. Welcome to the channel membership. And I just saw Neden uh, Moskowitz checking in. Welcome to the channel as well. That's great. And so no obligation by, by any measure. But for those of you that might be new to this live stream, we do have the opportunity for you to join the channel as a supporting member and it's just a way to support the channel there's also some really nice perks that are thrown in and so those of you that are already members know that we've already been enjoying some of those perks in just this first month that we've had the channel membership so thank you for joining the channel but you're still going to get all these live streams you're still going to get all of my regular videos for free there's there's absolutely no obligation it's just a little bit extra for those of you that want to help support the channel so thank you for doing that um, I see Jay Dixon talking to Simplify Gardening. I didn't see you check in, Tony, but it's good to see you. I hope you're doing well and you've had a nice start to, to your new year. Simplify Gardening is a great gardening channel. Those of you that are regular viewers know that I just uh, love Tony O'Neill and the Simplify Gardening channel, and we've done some things together, and we are planning to do more things together. But it's great to see you here today, Tony. So nice to have you and everybody else. This is just a, an awesome community. And so uh, as we move forward into the rest of our winter, for those of us on the northern side of the planet, and those of you on the southern side of the planet that are starting to move towards your fall, uh, I, I want to answer your questions. And so uh, every week I try to have some very specific ideas to throw out at you. And today I really want to focus on your specific issues, the questions that you might be having today, like the ones that I've just recently answered. So keep those questions coming. I'm going to try to get to as many questions as I can today. If you put the, the Gardner Scott at Gardner Scott in your question, I'm much more likely to see it. 
and that way we can get you answered if you've got something that's pressing. I've just started doing some of my seeds. I have a video coming out here in just a few days about winter sowing. And this is one of those things, uh, most of you know that I program out my videos uh, well in advance. So I've been planning this winter sowing video for quite a while. And I'm seeing a lot of other winter sowing videos popping up by other gardening channels as well. So this is one of those kind of subjects because I'm always encouraging you to seek out other information and learn as much as you can. This is a great example of one of those type of subjects, winter sowing, sowing your seeds uh, during the winter time in some type of container outside. And so my video is coming up, but there's a ton of other videos out there. So this is a real good one where you can watch my video and watch others' videos and then compare notes. And, and you'll notice that many of the things we do are the same because the basic techniques of winter sewing is the same regardless of who's doing the video. But I, I of course, always try to give extra information. And so um, you'll see that coming up here pretty soon. Stevie Long with the St. Gardner Scott had a lush fall garden and raised beds. Uh, lettuce, peas, herbs. How do I remove these plants? Cut them off or pull them up? I actually did a video about this a couple months ago. And the basic idea is how you plan to use the bed again and what the plants are. So for smaller plants that are left behind as the winter progresses, I'll just cut them off right at the surface and I'll leave the root in the ground. For most of the, the typical smaller vegetable plants that we're growing in the garden. You don't need to pull out the root and that adds more organic matter to the soil. So for plants like lettuces, um, I did an awful lot of that where I just cut the lettuce off at the, at the surface. The root is still in the soil. It helps keep that soil structure in place. And then I'll just spread the leaves of that lettuce on top of the soil. Now for the bigger plants with really robust roots, the tomatoes, for instance, I'll pull those roots out of the ground because when I put more plants into that bed, I don't want those big roots that are already there to disrupt any of the other plants I'm, I'm trying to grow. So for the softer plants like the lettuces, um, I'll leave those roots in the ground. But for the bigger, sturdier, uh, um, more woody plants like the, the peppers and the tomatoes and the pumpkins, I'll pull those roots out so that that space is freed up for the seeds that I'll be starting when the weather improves. So you can do a little bit of both and experiment, see which one works best for you. Um, I try to keep the labor down as much as possible. And that's why if I can, I'll leave the roots in the ground for those softer plants because their roots will decompose quicker than those bigger, sturdier plants. Um, Tammy Bolander is asking, are the paper pots you make with a little pot maker and newspaper okay to use for seed starting or will I run into problems with them? Um, good question. And on my, my website <coughs> that I don't often spend much time on, I have a little slideshow that I did years and years ago that show how to make newspaper pots. Um, at some point, I'll, I'll add that that uh, to a video, but I don't have it planned in the, in the near future. Um, they work fine. There's absolutely no problem with using uh, a, a maker, one of those little pot makers with a couple sheets of newspaper and you make a little newspaper pot. And it's the same basic concept of, that we were starting with where we talked about the peat pots. The idea being that you place the whole pot, the newspaper and the soil and the seedling all in the ground. And then that newspaper, when it stays moist, the roots can grow through it and it adds some organic material to the soil. The, the biggest issue to be aware of is that that newspaper will get wet when you water those seedlings. And so it can start to break down and uh, the, the soil will, will flow out of it and the plants can grow through it. So when I use newspaper pots, I make sure that the newspaper pots are all placed very close to each other, just like you would see in a 70 do cell tray. And so the newspaper pots are supporting each other and they stay that way from the time you start the seeds until you transplant them outside because that wet newspaper isn't very strong. And especially if you try to handle it, the whole thing can break apart. But yeah, yeah, they work. It's a nice way to recycle newspaper and you can just put the whole thing in the ground. It's not 
best suited for the bigger plants that you'll be growing. So like I wouldn't do tomatoes or peppers in the newspaper pots because there's just not enough room. But for lettuces and plants that you're going to be putting out in the garden that are still relatively small, try newspaper pots. It, it, it could be a, a nice little fun way to, to learn more about seedlings and putting the whole thing in the ground. So that's that's one idea. And uh, yeah, like um, Tony's saying, there are core pots now too. So uh, you can get the, the peat pots, you can get the cocoa core pots, you can get manure pots, um, you can get paper-based pots. There's all kinds of, of opportunities out there and they all basically do the same thing. You put the whole pot in the ground and it eventually decomposes. Okay, uh, Mr. Texas Bone, hello to you as well. Good to see you this morning. Craig saying, other than the physical obstruction in the ground, will underground power lines affect power growth? Um, most of the underground power lines should be buried quite a, a, a distance deep. I think my power lines here, um, I think they're four feet deep. So they're between three and four feet deep. That should be the minimum for most areas. I'm not aware of any studies that I've seen that show they have any impact on the plants as well. They're well shielded and your plants aren't going to be growing that deep. So um, no, there hasn't been an issue. It does raise an important factor though. If you're growing in your garden uh, or planning to expand your garden, I should say building in your garden, always make sure that you have the, the power lines, the phone lines, all of those cables uh, identified ahead of time. And then in the United States, you dial 811 and set it all up and inspectors will come out and they'll mark all of your lines just to make sure you don't inadvertently dig into them. Because while my power lines might be that deep, they might not be that deep in your area. I did have that problem in Oklahoma many years ago when I was putting in a little fenced section on the side of the house and I was driving in a T-post and while the lines were buried pretty deeply farther out, closer to the house, they weren't as deep and sure enough, I severed one of the power lines going into the house, which wasn't a happy event. Uh, you need to make sure that they're always marked before you do any of the digging. But as far as interfering with the plants, um, no, they shouldn't be. I wouldn't recommend growing trees and really deep rooted plants on top of or very near some of those lines after you've had them marked but for basic vegetable gardening stuff it shouldn't be an issue at all laura's saying we made paper pots last year and found that they tended to get moldy and some of the seedlings died as a result how can we prevent this um, i haven't had issues with mold but anytime you have mold it it just means it's too wet of an environment and so the outside of the paper pot and the top of the surface of the soil will dry out faster. And so most of us end up killing our plants with kindness because we just want to keep watering and keep watering. So if you have a good potting soil mix, it should stay moist for a pretty long period of time. So you can stop watering in many cases for a day, maybe even two, to allow that paper to dry out and to allow the surface of the soil to dry out and the inside of that pot where the roots are growing should stay moist. Now stay on top of it because you don't want to keep it dry for too long, but that's one way to do it is just to um, hold back on the watering. You can also put a fan on your plants and that air circulation will help cut down on some of those mold issues um, and any other fungi issues that you might have or the, the fungus gnats by putting a fan around your seedlings that'll help them stay a little bit drier air circulation is is always a good idea if you have any type of fungal issues with your plants Tobias Mallo saying hello Scott love the channel thank you love that you're here I've seen in some channels the use of a mix of compost and sand as cheap general purpose potting soil is it safe if so what type of sand should i use um, i think it depends on the plant but yes sand and compost the idea in in general now i'll use compost with perlite or compost with vermiculite and the, the perlite and the vermiculite is to improve the drainage because with peat and with compost and with core they're holding the moisture. And so if you use them by themselves, you'll 
end up with a soggy mess. So you need some type of additional material for drainage. And I use perlite or vermiculite. Sand achieves the same thing. That's, that's the same basic idea. Now sand can actually hold a lot of moisture when mixed with another ingredient like compost. And so I find that I have better drainage with perlite than with sand. Um, but, but no, it's, it's generally not a problem at all. As far as what type of sand, I would use a sand with a larger grain. And so um, you can get sands that have a very fine grain and you can get sands that have a very um, large grain. So I would get a larger grain sand that has better drainage. And often at uh, a lot of our, our home centers, you'll, you'll find like um, sandbox sand. And, and that is usually got a pretty big grain to it. And I've used that before in some of my potting mixes as well and, and haven't had any issues. So give it a try, see what you think. Um, I, I prefer perlite just because it's easier to work with and I can see the perlite or the vermiculite in my mix to know that I've got enough or, or not enough. Um, whereas the sand tends to bind with the compost. And so unless you have a really good formula where you're mixing together, uh, you might you might get a little out of balance, which usually isn't a big problem. But um, go ahead and try it. See what you think. Um, it's it, This is another one of those things about gardening is you hear something, go ahead and try it. Sometimes it'll work. Sometimes it won't. Write it down in your journal, and that's a good way to figure out whether you like it or not. Presley Moore is saying, last spring... Oh, you just disappeared. Let me find you again. Last spring, cucumber beetles and other pests destroyed my plants in the raised beds despite row covers, suggestions. And so a lot of those, like the cucumber beetles, <coughs> they actually emerge from the soil. And so there's a lot of pests we have in our garden that during the summer growing months, these the adult pests will appear. They may devastate your garden. They might not do any damage at all, but they'll lay their eggs in the soil. Or some of them might leave, leave, uh, lay their eggs in the the plant stems themselves and so you can put row covers over your your plants uh, over your beds the next season as you put your seeds in but those eggs are still there and so as the seedlings emerge you got it covered well yeah it's covered against the adult insects but you're basically holding in all of those juvenile insects that are emerging from the soil and that's probably what happened in your case. The best way to combat that is, like you've already done, identify the pests, but then learn about their life cycle. So when you look at the cucumber beetle, you'll hopefully learn to recognize what their eggs look like. And you can learn the idea that the, the, the larva will be emerging from the soil. And one of the easiest ways to fix cucumber beetles when you start having that problem is to just disrupt the soil. Now, I'm a big fan of no-dig gardening, but this is one of those instances where digging in your garden bed can disrupt the life cycle of a specific pest. So even if you're practicing no-dig gardening, if you've got an infestation and if you've identified a particular type of pest that will bury eggs or the eggs will hatch and then the larva will burrow into the soil, if you know you have that kind of pest in the fall and early spring, all you have to do is just disrupt the soil, turn it over, get a cultivator out there and mix it up down to a couple inches. And you'll often be able to see the grubs the larva in the soil. Um, this is another good reason to have chickens because you can take the chickens out in, in fall and early spring and they'll take care of those grubs, that larval growth in your beds. Uh, but that's the key is, is trying to disrupt the life cycle. So at the end of the season, get rid of infected plants that might have eggs and larva in them and then also be ready to deal with the soil itself. In the short term, like this season, I would suggest go ahead and plant those plants in different beds because you may have the infestation in the bed where they were growing last year. Well, by avoiding that bed and then dealing with whatever emerges, uh, that's 
keeping the new plants safe. And so like a cucumber beetle will actually eat a number of different plants. But if you plant something in that bed that the cucumber beetle doesn't eat, well, now you've disrupted their life cycle. So the larva is emerging, looking for something to eat, and there's nothing to eat in that bed. Now that larva may not grow into an adult, and you might not have as much of a problem in the future. In addition to attracting beneficial insects and birds, those, those are often the best ways to deal with it. <clears throat> so Paul's asking, are cucumber beetles the same as pickle worms? Um, so I'm, I'm not sure. I, I've seen some things on pickle worms, um, but that's one of those terms I think is regional. Um, so I can't give you an exact answer, but the idea of what pickle worms are as far as the, the larvae that are eating at the roots of cucumbers and similar plants, um, then yes, it's the same basic idea. It's just the insect at different stages of life. And so when it's larva and it looks like a worm and it's in the soil, we'll call it one thing. And when it's an adult and it's emerging and it's laying eggs on our plants, we'll call it something else. So um, it, it may be the same thing. I'm just not as familiar with what you call pickle worms, but th the idea is out there. Garden Master 242, hello back to you. Good to see you. Sherazad's saying, Gardner Scott, any information on microgreens? I live in Ohio Zone 6. I want to plant stuff. Um, I don't have any videos yet on microgreens. There's some real good stuff out there. Um, Kevin at Epic Gardening, I think, has some of the best videos on microgreens. Um, he's got a very popular channel, got a lot of great information. And so I'll just direct you to Epic Gardening to find out more about microgreens because I think he's got some of the, the best videos on that subject that are out there. But yeah, definitely something easy to grow inside during the winter months. And I say go for it. Um, it's, a, it's a lot of fun to go out and cut off some of those microgreens and throw in a salad or, or a shake or whatever you're using them for. And then they keep growing. Or and you start a whole other tray and you've got multiple trays of different stages of growth microgreens can be wonderful the oil medics thank you for that contribution i appreciate the super chat good to see you here as well and uh, always looking forward to your participation that's nice okay let's see what else we have popping up um yeah strong style strong style organics it says collect your pests and have them id'd and that's really the, in my opinion, the best way to deal with pests. I, I do not like the idea of using pesticides. And, and especially for new gardeners, that's a very common practice. You see a pest, and so you spray a pesticide. Well, one, the pesticide may have no effect at all on that particular pest. Two, the pesticide is probably going to kill some of the beneficial insects in your garden. And three, I just don't think it's a good idea to just try to use one solution for a problem that you're not even sure what the problem is. And so by identifying a pest, you're learning more about the, the garden, you're learning more about your plants, you're learning more about the insects in your garden, and you may find out that there's a great beneficial predatory insect out there that is very easy to attract. I, I think growing dill and or fennel is one of the best things you can do in the garden. So if you're not planning on growing dill or fennel, you should plan on it because that is one of the best plants to attract some of these predatory wasps and some of the beneficial insects. But still, continue to identify the pest, and that way that'll give you the best idea for the best control of that pest. Okay, let's see. Yeah, Lewis is saying you can grow microgreens year-round, way more food, don't have to wait for maturity, pests, or fertilizer routine. Microgreens are 40 times the nutrient-dense of mature plants. Yep, absolutely. And one of the nice things about microgreens, and, and you raise a good point, you can do it year-round. So I've been talking in recent weeks about starting your seeds under lights, and the focus is on the vegetable garden in spring and summer. Well, if you go to all the trouble of getting a light system set up and you have all those trays and you're growing all these plants for your summer garden, you don't have to stop there. Use the same lights and use the same trays for microgreens for the rest of the year. Um, and so it, it really is a nice way to, to always have a garden going, whether it's indoors or outdoors. And for much of the year, you can do both. So um, let's hear it for microgreens. I, 
I, I'm not planning a microgreen video anytime soon, but maybe I'll, I'll amp up my production a little bit and see if I can get something out before the end of the year. Um, but yeah, great, great thing to do. <coughs> Sherazad says, any info on microgreens? Um, uh, oh, is that a repeat? I think we just saw that. <laughs> okay. Um, Taco Promotions is asking how to get rid of roaches in the garden. Same basic idea. I don't have a roach problem, but you have to understand the life cycle of the roaches. So they're going to nest and they're going to feed and they're going to lay eggs and continue growing at very specific times of year in very specific areas of your garden. So the first thing is to identify the type of roach. Then you can figure out based on doing some research where they like to live. So they might be living underneath neath a leaf pile. They might be um, li living underneath a log and then they come out and they're coming into the garden. That's the first step is try to identify how they live, what their habitat is. And that's the, the first method. You just disrupt their habitat and then you start looking at the other ways that you can trap them or deal with them. But I, I can't give you a lot of specifics on roaches because I don't have that problem. But the same basic idea is out there. Just do the research, find out about the pest, find out what kind of um, other animals might do it. So, so for instance, you might have some raccoons in your area that you've been trying to get rid of. Well, raccoons will eat roaches. And so you might want to attract raccoons to the habitat where the roaches are. That's, that's how you learn about keeping the whole garden in balance. If you try to keep something out, you might be inviting something else in that could be a worse problem. So um, if, if any of the rest of you have ideas about roaches and what you've done, go ahead and uh, throw that out there because that might be beneficial. Rupa's saying, please suggest some good North Texas gardening channel or groups for the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, I don't have any good suggestions for that area. I do know that Roots and Refuge is a great channel. Most of you probably watch her and um, Scott Head's um, Black Gumbo channel. Um, they're in the same basic area. I think they're in, in um, like zones 8B and 9A. Uh, which is probably pretty close to what you're experiencing in Texas. I know a lot of the weather patterns are pretty similar to some of those. Um, so I'm, there aren't any Texas channels that I follow or am aware of, but those are a couple that might have some similar conditions that you can find information from. Jennifer saying, hello, Gardner Scott. My garden suffers from these rodents that dig tunnels all around my garden. Hard to find them except their trails around the garden. Um, it's probably voles. Um, voles are a rodent, um, mouse size rodent, and you'll often see the, the tunnels that are being dug. The, the moles and the gophers won't, you won't be able to see their tunnels. You'll be able to see the entrances to the, the tunnels as they, they dig them out. But if you can actually see the tunnel, it's probably a vole. And so I would suggest that you look into voles. And, and again, getting your garden in balance. I have a couple neighborhood cats that help keep my vole problem in check. Now, I don't own cats, but when I see the cats in the garden, I'm okay with that. They haven't disrupted my plants. They're not pooping in my garden beds, but they're hunting the voles. And so if, if you have a vole problem, you might want to encourage um, cats or owls or hawks, the natural predators, uh, because it's really hard to actually deal with a vole. You can see their tunnels, but they've got such a huge network. Uh, I, I'm not aware of too many people that have success with trying to trap them. I just try to have nature help out, and uh, the cats in my neighborhood help take care of the voles. But look into research on voles with a V, and that might be what you've got. And that might also help out as far as you learning what you need to do to control. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, Greg says, voles love stealing melons. Um, I haven't had that issue. Um, I, I, know, I know that they've uh, damaged some of my flowers, but um, thank goodness they haven't had or ha they haven't encountered my, uh, my melons yet. In my, my new area that you may have seen in the background of, of some of my videos, I've got the metal beds. Those metal beds are actually buried 
uh, eight to 10 inches deep, partly to deter the voles from getting inside that garden area, which is where I'm going to be growing my melons. So there's one way is just to have a barrier in the ground. All of my beds have wire at the bottom of them as well to try to keep some of those burrowing animals from coming up into the bed. So, uh, and since I just talked about the background, let's talk about today's background. This comes from Joseph Lambert. And you can see um, just over my shoulder here, that's um, Ruger that's helping out. This is an end of garden picture from Joseph's garden. The garden is basically behind my head and you can see uh, the shed and the garden and some of the other projects that he's working on is wheelbarrow loading rocks and and i think that's a water feature that he's doing over in this area right here um, but joseph sent this picture to me a while ago i still have quite a few pictures in the queue that i'll continue to show so if you want your picture as my background uh send it to gardener scott at gardener scott.com but I've got a whole bunch that are lined up and I'd love to see more. It's going to take us many weeks to get through the pictures I have, but it's always nice to highlight someone like Joseph with pets in the garden. That's one thing I really like about a uh, picture of Ruger standing guard over the garden area. He did send me another picture a little bit after this with another dog um, that wasn't so garden friendly and had to put a fence around it. I love gardening with animals. I, I, I think it's great to be out in a space that you love with animals that you love, but they can be a problem. And so you may need to fence the area or teach them to stay out of the garden bed. You got to do what, what you got to do. But anyone that, that gardens with animals, I think, is, is a special gardener because it really does help make gardening that much more special. So thanks, Joseph, for having the photo today. Um, yeah, Mage, I'll repeat it again. Um, it's send it to Gardener Scott at Gardener .com. and do give me permission. So if you send me a picture, please say that I have your permission to use it as a background just so we don't run into any copyright issues. And, and I don't want to share something that you don't want me to share because I've had people send me pictures of their gardens asking questions with no intention of me putting it behind me for thousands of people to see. So do give me the permission that you want me to be using the picture as a background and then any additional information that you'd like me to share. And, and I'll definitely add it to the queue and you may see it in the weeks ahead. Heidi Clark is saying that's a win-win situation. I used to have cats in my old yard, but they did go potty in my beds. I had to cover all the soil around my plants with boards. Um, and I had that problem at my last house in the garden. And you probably know, Heidi, and the rest of you that have encountered problems with cats, when you're digging in the soil to transplant and you come across that special presence that the cat has left you, that is not a fun gardening experience. And so you may need to put something on the soil to disrupt the cats from getting in. Chicken wire is, is a great, you can spread chicken wire over the soil surface and cats don't like to walk on that. There's lots of other things like that that you can put on top of the soil that the cats don't like to walk on. Um, and that's another reason why I have raised beds because the cats tend to stay on the ground. Those cats that are looking for voles, they're not jumping into my beds because I've got the higher raised beds. So yet another reason to have raised beds. But uh, yeah, I let them patrol, patrol. And occasionally you might have an issue with cats in your beds, but you have to weigh it which is more important, getting rid of the, the voles and the gophers and all those other things that the cats can help deal with or an occasional issue inside the bed with the, the cat droppings. Uh, okay, let's see what else we have going on. Um, MB Gardner is saying, I have a winter garden with a low hoop tunnel that's covered with aphids. Spraying with safer soap containing neem oil isn't helping. The ladybugs survive when the temperatures... Um, the low temperatures are 24 in Denver. It's a little cold for ladybugs. However, this last year, uh, I saw my ladybugs start to appear in early April and we were still getting freezing at night. And so they can survive the cold temperatures, but it's, they're probably not going to be out this early. Um, and so uh, neem oil, I, I also have found that neem oil isn't as effective on aphids. You can use 
and, and uh, a soap, uh, and, and that can help. The, the thing about aphids is if you can just knock them off the plant, they're not going to climb back up. You know, for them, if you knock an aphid from your plant down to the ground, it's not going to walk the equivalent of miles to get to the plant and then climb back up again. So just knocking them off the plant is often enough. Spraying them off so the, the neem oil might not work as well. But if you take a good strong spray, even if it's a, a hand spray, uh, and, and get those aphids off the plant and an insecticidal uh, soap, um, or a, um, an oil, those are some of the things that you can use to deal with aphids. But that's one of the issues with growing early in the season under hoops is when you have a pest like that appear, the natural predator, like a ladybug, their life cycle isn't at the same point. And so the young ladybugs aren't out there yet. It's going to be another month or two in the Denver area probably. So just try to get rid of those aphids, knock them off the plant, keep spraying with neem oil, do some of those, those gardening soap products out there, and, and that can help. Um, I'll, I'll get out there with my thumb and just crush as many aphids as I can in some of those situations until the ladybugs and the lacewings and all those other uh, insects start to appear. Okay. Um, Lily, it's saying, I've seen that it's good to hydrate your seed starting mix <clears throat> with boiling water. Is boiling water good or bad for potting mix when transplanting seedlings to a bigger container size? So boiling water can be good. The idea is that, that you put boiling water in your mix, hopefully to kill fungus gnat eggs. That's the most common reason people will put boiling water in their potting mix. It's to kill the eggs of of fungus gnats and other potential issues. You do that and then of course you let it cool and then you you can use it just like you would potting mix um, and you put the seeds in it or you put this, the, the transplants in it. It's just that initial use of the boiling water to kill any of the pest eggs that might be in that mix. That's the reason you do it. If you've got good soil um, that's already sterile, you probably won't have that issue. <clears throat> it's not a big deal for potting mix because bacteria really haven't, the beneficial bacteria really haven't started developing yet. And so you do it at the very beginning, then you put your, your plants in and, and it works just fine. So uh, yeah, go ahead and try it. It's, you know, it's not going to harm anything and it could actually cut down on some potential pests. Uh, let's see what else we have popping up. Mage Gray Wolf says, I find a mix of peppermint and garlic oil in water works pretty well for deterring pests and insects. Doesn't seem to bother good bugs as well. Um, yeah, I've seen that too. I've, I've got mint growing in my garden and lots of garlic. Um, I haven't actually used a mix of that. Um, but if you find it works, then go for it. Go for it. I, I can't speak from personal experience for that. But, it, but as with all gardening, if it works, do it. Okay, <clears throat> yeah, Judy's saying, I use boiling water, cover with aluminum foil, and let it cool down. Good idea. That's a good way to, to approach it. And Janan uh, Johnson is saying, boiling water works great for me. No gnats since starting that way. So there you have it. Some others that are doing the same thing. And, and you don't have to worry about um, harming any of the beneficial stuff because there isn't the beneficial stuff happening in that potting mix yet. <clears throat> Richard W. saying gardening in the north has an awesome video on microgreens. Great. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that input. Um, what else have you got about gardening in, in the winter time? Specific questions. Uh, the, depending on what zone you're in, uh, you may all, I know some of you are already putting things outside under hoops or not because your, your weather is starting to improve. I still have a couple months of really cold conditions yet. But this is one of those uh, warm winters. As, as I talked in a, in a recent video about the hardiness zones, I'm in zone 5B, which means that my average low temperature historically is minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit. And let's see, that's minus 26 degrees Celsius. But this year, we've got nowhere near that. I think our coldest day so far has been five degrees, which is minus 15 Celsius. Now, our coldest days typically come in February, so who knows what next month is going to bring, but we've been having a pretty warm winter so far. Cold, 
our, our nighttime temperatures are well below freezing. Most of our days are hovering around freezing, but nowhere near the really cold conditions that have historically been average for my area. So I'm guessing a lot of you are probably experiencing the same thing. I know in the, in the States we've had some big storms, but as far as the cold, cold, I haven't seen too much of that. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens through the rest of the winter. <clears throat> Hot Pepper Paul says, currently growing onions and garlic. Um, I was just checking on my garlic yesterday. It, it's, it's doing fine. I put it in the ground three months ago. It's probably another month or two before it starts popping up again. Um, but I'm, it's still early for me to be putting the, the onions in the bed. But that's good for you. Um, you can definitely grow a lot more in Florida than some of the rest of us do. And Tony's saying, no dig supports the soil food web instead of destroying it. Helps with structure of the soil too. Absolutely. And I'm trying to get more and more to, to no dig. Um, I've talked about that at, in the past as well. <clears throat> no dig gardening um, has so many benefits to it. Not only just you add a couple inches of compost every year, so you're always adding organic material to keep the nutrients uh, the nutrient levels high in your soil. But once you start developing all that bacterial and fungal growth, uh, your plants are just going to get better. Uh, my soil is just so bad, it's going to take me a few years to enrich it to the point where I can sit back and enjoy the benefits of no dig. But I know Tony in the UK and Charles Dowding and many other UK gardeners uh, have, a, have a different environment. It's a lot easier to do no dig and I applaud you for those efforts because it really is a great way to garden. Pat Patrick, thank you for that super chat. That's awesome. What is the minimum room temperature in a grow light area? Great, great question. And so um, it does depend on the plant. And so if you're growing the cool season plants ahead of time, so if you're growing the broccoli and cabbage and lettuce and onions, if you're growing those ahead of time, they can handle cooler temperatures. Whereas the warm season plants like the tomatoes and the peppers need warmer conditions. So in general, if you aim for 70 degrees Fahrenheit, about 20 degrees Celsius, that's a good target for your grow room temperature. And that's a typical household temperature during the winter time. <clears throat> and so for many of us, we don't need supplemental heat because most of the plants will do okay in that particular range around that 70 degree Fahrenheit range. <clears throat> and so what you need to look at is the other plants. So 21 degrees Celsius, but yet you want to grow peppers. You may find out that your peppers are not doing as well at that temperature. And this is where heat mats come in or some additional heating. And so what I'll do with my peppers is I'll put a heat mat underneath the peppers. And so the air temperature for me is still around 70 degrees Fahrenheit, but the soil temperature is now warmer for those seedlings, for those peppers. And that's what they really want. <clears throat> They're not as concerned about the air temperature as many of us think they're concerned about the soil temperature. And that's really what's affecting the root development. And so in a 70 degree air environment, the soil temperature is not going to be 70 degrees. It's gonna be colder than that, or it could be warmer than that if you put a heating mat under it. And so look at your plants first to determine if you are okay with cooler than that. So I say target 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 21 Celsius, 10 degrees cooler than that is just fine. And my house gets cooler at night because I, I have the furnace shut off and then it kicks back on in the morning. And so if it drops down to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 16 degrees Celsius um, for a period of time, that's not going to harm the plants either. <clears throat> but for the peppers and the tomatoes, it will slow their growth. So even with the air temperature dropping down that low, I'm not worried because I've got heat mats under those plants that prefer the warmer conditions. And so it, it's, it's plant specific as to how low they can go and how hot you should make it. And so I hope that helps. I, I target 
to try to keep it at about 70 degrees Fahrenheit during the day. It's actually closer to 62 degrees Fahrenheit at night. But because it's in the basement, the basement gets colder than where I have my thermostat. So that's why I'm expecting that it's a few degrees cooler where my plants are growing. But, but they still do just fine. I did buy this last year um, a fan that, that has a heater attached to it. And so in the early days of the seedlings, I'll turn that fan on that's blowing out warm air across those young seedlings. That also helps keep the soil temperature a little higher um, because that where the water is evaporating at the surface, that's going to be the coolest point in your soil because the evaporating air is going to drop the, uh, the temperature a little bit. And so by putting a heated fan, that might be one way to help keep the air a little bit warmer and the soil temperature a little bit warmer around your plants. But I wouldn't be too concerned about it unless you're really trying to grow very specific plants like orchids that need a very hot, humid environment. For most of the plants that we're starting indoors for our vegetable garden, household temperatures in general will be okay. The peppers and the tomatoes will still grow at those temperatures. They'll just do better if the soil temperature is warmer. Okay, let's see what else we have popping up. Uh, let's see, what, Richard's talking about the boxer finding them. I'm not sure what they're finding, but if you've got a boxer, you're doing great in the garden. Um, slightly Stacy says, thanks for the info, guys. So again, thanks to all of you who are helping to answer the questions uh, that I can't get to. I think that's incredible. Um, Tony, you're staying very active today. That's also nice. It's so good to see that. Um, Let's see if we have anything else that's popping up. Um, yeah, Peter was asking, have you ever started onions from seeds? Did you have success with it? Oh, yeah, yeah. In fact, um, because I've had success, I prefer to start my onions from seeds um, rather than buying the starts. And so most people will, will buy the starts. Those are the, the onions that are, that are already partially grown. And you find them in little bundles at your nursery. And then you plant those starts. Those are our full-size plants that have just started to go dormant because they're not being watered anymore. So you put them in the ground and then they have to, to rehydrate and then start growing again. <clears throat> so you're putting a stressed plant in the ground and onions can recover from that. But if you grow your onions from seed, you'll get that same size plant that you can put in the garden and it's not as stressed. And so I've had great success with starting onions indoors and then putting them outside at that same point, like where they're pencil thin, that's about the size you'll buy them at the nursery. That's when you transplant them outside and they'll do, they'll do just fine. Um, as we've talked about in recent weeks, just make sure you're growing the right type of onion for your latitude, because depending on where you are in the world, different onions will do um, better or worse, depending on how much sunlight they're getting during the course of the growing season. But yeah, I've had great success. And, and actually, if you have the right type of onion, you don't even need to work hard. So at the school garden years ago, I had a bed of, of I actually had a couple different types of, of bunching onions and bulbing onions and uh, planned to harvest a lot of the seeds. So I let them stay in the ground until they flowered and then set seed and I just couldn't get enough students to help out to harvest all the seeds. So most of the seeds actually fell back onto the soil surface. And the next year we had, we had onions everywhere. And so that's how, how easy it is to grow onions. You could go out right now, even if you're in the frozen north and there's snow on the ground, and you could throw onion seeds on your beds. And I can pretty much assure you that when spring comes, a lot of those seeds will be sprouting because they're that sturdy. I've seen it happen in, in the school garden with thousands and thousands of onion plants sprouting where we planted nothing. Uh, the seeds just fell and they spent the winter in place and popped up in the spring. So yeah, they can be really easy to grow. Okay, PD is saying my compost bins, four feet by five feet, have gone down to about 90 to 100 degrees from 120 to 140. Moisture level seems good. Should I turn it over to get it heated up again? Um, you can. Um, the, you're dealing with different types of bacteria. <clears throat> and so the hotter pile, hotter pile 
will have the thermophilic bacteria, which are really active and they keep that pile hot, where in the 90 degree range, the 90 degree Fahrenheit is about 30 to 32 degrees Celsius. You're dealing with the um, mesophilic bacteria, I believe it is. And so different types of bacteria at those different ranges, but they'll still continue to decompose. They'll still break down. You just won't get as quick a decomposition at those medium range temperatures. Um, but I actually prefer a pile in that 80 to 90 degree Fahrenheit range because you'll get more insect activity. You'll get the beetles come in, you'll get the earthworms coming in, and they'll help break down the pile as well. When you have a pile above 120 degrees Fahrenheit at about 49 degrees Celsius, then, then you're locking out all of that, those insects, which can also help break down the material. So I actually prefer a cooler pile. Uh, but, but if you want to keep it hot, then yes, you need to get out there. You need to turn it because those thermophilic bacteria need a lot of oxygen. And that's probably why it's slowed down is because they're not getting the oxygen. So up to you. Turn it to get the temperature back up or keep it where it's at and just let the, the medium range bacteria go to work and, and you'll still end up with compost. <clears throat> and so, um, yeah, Heidi's answering for me. I do grow horseradish. Um, so... Um, I had, uh, I had a, a, a Christmas dinner I went to and they were serving prime rib and I love fresh horseradish on prime rib. And I said, I'll bring the horseradish. And I went out on Christmas day to harvest some horseradish to serve on the Christmas prime rib. And the ground is so frozen in my garden. I couldn't even begin to break it apart to harvest the horseradish. So I do grow horseradish with the intent of harvesting it throughout the year, but I had forgotten just how frozen my soil can get. And so I can't harvest the horseradish during the cold winter months. I'll have to get in the habit of harvesting before the ground freezes in the future. So uh, another plant that's really easy to grow and just, just shucks off whatever harsh weather comes and just does great. <clears throat> um, Bettina, thank you for helping out Catherine there. I've got, um, a big video library and the Hugo culture. Uh, I've got a few different. So I got one video specifically on Hugo culture. I've got another video about filling raised beds where I use whole Hugo culture methods. I've got the video talking about my pumpkins that are growing in my Hugo culture bed. So if you're interested in Hugo culture, I've, I've got a number of videos um, that talk about that in the library. And, and for all of my videos, just go to the Gardner Scott channel page. And you'll see a bunch of the videos popping up right there on the title page. Uh, you can also click on videos that will take you to the full library, or you can click on playlists because I have a lot of the videos broken into different types of playlists. Um, I think the video that I just did was video number 243. And then this is live stream number 45. So there's a lot of stuff in the library and on all kinds of different topics. And with Tony as active here, Tony at the Simplified Gardening Channel has got more videos than I do. And so uh, a couple great resources for a lot of great information. Check out the channels and you'll see a ton of videos with a lot of good stuff. Okay, Mr. Texas Bone, I'm trying to seaweed and leaves compost this year. That's great. Um, I don't have access to a lot of seaweed. Seaweed is relatively expensive if I can find it. Um, I love leaves as compost, but I like that idea of seaweed and leaves. And I've seen um, some UK videos of UK gardeners using seaweed a lot in the garden. If you've got access to seaweed, I say go for it. It's got a lot of great nutrients and minerals in that seaweed. And so it can really be a nice um, addition to your soil food web, helping add all that nutrition to your soil. That's great. Okay, Masabi Gal saying, try blending roasted beet with horseradish, a great Polish condiment. Um, that's a great idea because I grow a lot of beets as well. And I'll pickle my beets, but uh, I like that idea of horseradish with beets. Thank you. That's, uh, that's an interesting idea. I'll have to give that a try later, later in the year when I can harvest my ro horseradish again. Uh, Michelle saying, can you grow most plants in Hugo culture? Hopefully. Um, yeah, so, so Hugo culture is, 
is a basic way to improve your soil. So you dig a trench and you bury logs, or you don't dig a trench and you stack logs. And then you cover those logs or branches or twigs or leaves or wood chips, but that woody material, you cover that with soil and compost. And over time, the fungi in the soil will break down those woody materials and add nutrients to the soil. It takes a long time for it all to break down. So it's one of those things that over time the, the mound will get smaller as the organic material is broken down. But it's just a way to simply add organic material and nutrients to the soil without you having to get out there and just dig in compost every year. But what we're really doing is we're not planting in those logs. We're not planting where the roots are reaching all that woody material because there is plantable soil on top of that. So yes, you can grow any type of plant in a Hugo culture mound as long as that soil lever, level or layer, that soil layer of amended soil is deep enough for the roots that you're planning to grow. So if you've only got three inches of soil <clears throat> on top of all these logs, then you're probably not going to have much success if you plant tomatoes on top of that because the tomatoes will grow through that three inches and then there's nowhere to grow. They're going to hit those logs. It becomes a barrier and the, the roots just aren't going to give the plant its nutrition and the plant's not going to do well. But if you've only got three inches of soil on top of all of those logs, you could easily grow lettuces that have a much shallower rooting system. So it all gets back to the soil that your plant's roots are growing in and what those roots need. So for deep rooted plants, a huge culture mound can work after it's been there a long time and the material's aged, or you just need to make sure that that layer of soil on top of the logs is deep enough for those deep rooted plants. Uh, I, I had dug my pit, put my logs in, put more sticks and branches and leaves, covered it with compost and soil. And this last year grew pumpkins uh, and the pumpkins did great. Um, probably I had better success with pumpkins growing in the Hugo culture mound than anywhere I've ever grown the pumpkins before. So you can definitely grow whatever you want. Just make sure you've got enough soil to, to cover up that space. Okay, um, yeah, and Frank Barnwell raises a good point, and that's why one reason why I think I had such great success is that the rotten, spongy wood can be a moisture reserve, and that's a that's a, a primary reason why I'm doing Hugo culture in my garden because it's very dry, it's hard to keep the soil moist, and especially a plant like pumpkin that requires a lot of moisture, uh, they did great because all of that wood material in my Hugo culture mound that was breaking down was basically just a big spongy interior that was holding a lot of that moisture and, and the plants did great. So yeah, thank you for pointing that out too because that's a great reason for doing Hugo culture. Flu Jackson says, thanks Gardener Scott, you're welcome. Your videos helped me out a lot. First time gardener last year, much love from the Maritimes in Canada. I'm missing it so much this time of year. Well, thank you so much, I appreciate that. Um, I love the Maritimes in Canada. I love a lot of Canada. I've, I've literally, um, been in Canada all the way from um, Victoria and Vancouver all the way to Gander and Newfoundland and many places in between. So I live in the middle of the United States in Colorado, but I've, I've explored a lot of Canada over my time. So um, that's, that's good. I can understand you missing it at this time of year as well. That's good. Um, so, hey, Dreamsies, good to see you here. It's so nice to have people checking in. We've got some good numbers of people watching today. Um, what else do you have? Keep throwing your questions at us. We still have some time. Um, the yeah, Mage Grey Wolf is saying, that way the plants get the nutrients from the good soil and the crummy soil doesn't serve as a barrier. And I think you're probably also referring to the Hugo culture, but absolutely, absolutely. It's all, it's all making sure that, that the roots and the plants are getting what they want and whatever we can do to, to add that organic material is going to be beneficial. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, there's a, a couple other things that um, I just want to throw out at you talking about the, the winter garden concept. And that's, and I've said this before, 
this is a good time of year, as, we've, as I've already mentioned a couple of times, to start learning more about what you don't know. And so you're asking some great questions about pests and about beds and about the, the things that have uh, an issue or you have an issue with in your garden. Well, start putting those questions together, not just for me. This is a great opportunity for you to learn how to do the research. So if you've got a question about a pest or got a question about the soil and how to grow, uh, I, write down those questions. You don't have to put it in your journal, but write down those questions and start doing a search and start learning more about it because there's a lot of us out there like, like me and Tony that probably have a video to talk about the particular issue you're having and what better time than when it's too cold to be outside gardening than to be inside in a nice warm chair watching a video or reading a book and learning about some of these things that you're unsure of, especially if you're a new time gardener. <clears throat> so Georgia Gardener Kevin is saying, how long do I need to cold stratify my butterfly milkweed seed? Um, I think I've had the best success um, with about a six week stratification. <clears throat> and so um, the butterfly milkweed is, uh, is a great plant. I'm, I'm growing more and more uh, on that. Um, and that's another one of those plants that when it drops seed, those seeds will, uh, will stay on top of the soil surface and will grow on their own once they get established. But because it's a perennial plant that overwinters, the seeds will often do better if you cold stratify them, if you expose them to some cold conditions before you try to germinate them. The first year that I grew the milkweed, I didn't stratify and I probably had a 20% germination rate the next year. And this was at the school garden when I was still learning about cold stratification. The second year I cold stratified them and I probably had an 80% germination. So um, that's how big a difference it can make. And, and as, I, as I remember it, I used um, six weeks um, and had that, that better success. So that's one of those things um, that you can look into. Uh, Belinda saying, do you have an Amazon link? Uh, yeah, so if you look in the description beneath my videos, um, and mostly the videos I've done in the last year or two, some of my older videos don't have it. But yeah, if you look in the description, it should be there beneath this live stream as well. Um, you can see the link to the Amazon. I don't have an Amazon page um, where it's designed as a Gardner Scott store. You might see that for some video creators on Amazon. But if you click on the link, it takes you to Amazon through my Gardner Scott affiliation. Uh, and then, yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. It's a great way to support the channel. It doesn't cost you anything, but anything you buy on Amazon through that Gardner Scott link that's in the description, um, I'll get a small percentage of that sale um, from Amazon. And, uh, and so it's an easy way <clears throat> it's an easy way to support the Gardner Scott channel without spending any money at all. And so, uh, yeah, I appreciate you asking that question. That's great. So Severin Koski is saying, oh, and thanks, Jay. Jay just posted that link. So I appreciate that. Um, Severin Koski is saying, do I put all the seeds from a packet in the freezer or just the ones I want to sow when it comes to cold stratification? Uh, and so most of the time, you don't need to put them in the freezer. The, the refrigerator is enough, but, but do read the seed packet or the catalog. It should give you um, the specific information. Uh, now, I, I, just for ease, will most often put the whole package of seeds in the refrigerator, and then it, it stays there. And, but it depends on the seed, because there are some seeds that just require the cold. And so those are the packages that I'll put in. But last year I was growing some perennial plants that required a moist cold stratification. So for those seeds, I took a paper towel and put it inside a sandwich bag and then wet the paper towel. And then I took out the seeds that I was planning on germinating, put them on top of that wet paper towel and then put the whole sandwich bag in the refrigerator. So some of the seeds from that package ended up in the sandwich bag. The rest of the seeds that I wasn't going to germinate stayed in my seed storage box. So it depends on what kind of stratification the seeds require as to whether I put the whole package in or just put a portion of the seeds in. <clears throat> so you'll have to 
um, to, to read the package and find out just exactly what the requirements are for that. Um, and so Belinda says, thank you, you're welcome. Uh, Troy's saying, I started common milkweed last year in a, in a week, moist core in a sandwich bag. Oh, there you go, that's what I was just talking about. Freeze and thaw every day for a week. Um, yeah, so good, so thanks for, for pointing that out. And then you place it in a warm spot. Uh, and that's the key. So it needs the cold stratification um, during a period of time. And again, the seed packet or the seed site uh, online will should tell you just exactly what kind of stratification it is. Uh, a Prairie Moon Nursery, I highlighted in a recent video, their catalog has got great information about cold stratifying the different types of seeds. And so, yeah, that's exactly what I did as well, is after that baggie, that baggie with the paper towel, moist paper towel and seeds was in the refrigerator for about six weeks. Then I took it out and let it warm up again. And I, I just allowed the, the seeds actually germinate on that moist paper towel. Then I took those germinated seeds and put them into the potting mix to continue growing in little pots. Um, and then they grew in those pots until I transplanted them outside. And, and they did perfectly fine. So um, yeah, thank you for, for adding um, that you did it as well, because it works, that's how you do it. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's see, Jay's responding to Belinda Formosa. When I look at the URL section, it shows Gardner Scott-20. Yeah, that's exactly right. So on Amazon, um, and you may see this on other links as well, that it, um, my affiliation code is Gardner Scott-20. And so it's easiest just to click on the link in the description or the link that, that Jay just offered. Um, you could also go to, to the Amazon homepage. And I think if you click in Gardner Scott dash 20 and then refresh the page, the same thing happens, but that's too much work. It's easier just to click on the link. Lena, Abby, good to see you here today. Don't worry about being late. You can always catch up on this whole thing from the beginning um, and in the replay. Or if you're just checking in right now, and I do this on some of the live streams that I follow as well. If I check in late, uh, I'll just go ahead and, and click on the, the timeline at the bottom right back at the beginning and, and be watching. You'll be uh, an, a little over an hour behind the rest of us, but you'll be able to watch the whole thing from the beginning right now if you want to do that. You don't have to wait because there's usually a delay. I think it takes about 45 minutes for... YouTube to publish this as a video that you can watch on replay, but you can basically just rewind right now and watch it from the beginning if you're if you're clicking in late. So uh, there's one way to do it. Um, Clopady, I hope I pronounced that close to right. Um, harvested peppers off a seemingly healthy plant a few weeks ago, gave it a haircut. Now it seems like the plant has had zero growth since. Is this normal? Um, possibly, it depends on um, where you live and where you're growing. So if you're in the northern hemisphere, even if it's warm outside, like you're in one of the, the southern states of the United States, um, it can still be warm enough to grow peppers, but there might not be enough sunlight for the pepper to really start growing. So if you prune your peppers or any other plants that you're growing at this time of year in the northern hemisphere, the plant will still be alive, but there just might not be enough light to jumpstart the photosynthesis and get all that new growth going. So that could be uh, a big issue. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere and it's the middle of your summer, it could be that it's just too hot. Um, but, but my guess is that you probably, um, it, it's probably more of a light issue if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. That's probably the, the most uh, common reason. But if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, it could just be the heat and the humidity um, and that'll all, that'll stunt new growth during the, the the middle of summer. So just like we're in the middle of winter, and those on the other side of the planet are in the middle of summer, those hot conditions can stunt the growth of plants. It, it's a little counterintuitive, where it's like the sun's out and it's nice and warm, but again, it, it, plants get too hot, they slow down their growth. It stresses the plant. And so the plant is not going to put all of its energy into new leaf production if the plant is stressed. And so pruning during the middle of summer stresses the plant. And now you're giving those new leaves 
kind of an uneven start because the plant is stressed and it's it's continuing to stay in a stressful environment. So if that's where you're growing, I would say put some shade over it right now. Just cool down the plant, relieve some of that stress, and hopefully you'll see some new leaf development start to pop up. Jean-Pierre, good to see you here. I have since November uh, in my refrigerator. Um, I could not plant them because I, I moved to the country. Is next year still good to plant them? Oh, sure, sure. Um, yeah, seeds that you that you have. Now, it depends on the, the seed. It depends on the plant. But most of the seeds that we're growing in our garden will easily last a year. And if they're in your refrigerator, they'll last even longer. So cool, dark, dry storage is what the seeds need. Refrigerator's perfect for that. Now, there are some seeds like onion seeds don't last very long. After about a year, the germination won't be as good. Um, corn seed might only last one year, but most of the rest of the plants that we're growing, the onions, the peppers, the tomatoes, those seeds will last years in a refrigerator. And so, sure, next year you can take them out and sow them in your garden and they should do just fine. Um, and if, if they don't, you, there'll probably still be some germination. Even the seeds like onion seeds that are only supposed to last a year. Uh, I've still had onion seeds germinate two or three years later. You just don't have the high percentage of germination. Many of the seeds won't last long, but you can still get some germination even with old seed. So don't worry about it, Jean-Pierre. Um, go ahead and keep storing those seeds and put them out when you can and and then see how the germination and how they grow. They should be OK. <clears throat> Michael, hello to you from northern New York. Good to have you here today. It's so nice to have everybody um, checking in. And yeah, Laurel's asking a good question since it was difficult to read your question, Jean-Pierre. But um, if it's garlic that you meant, um, then I would actually try to put the garlic out as soon as possible. Garlic won't last for a year. Um, so good, good catch, Laura Full, and thank you for asking that question to help. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, Masabi Gal says, is there a good picture book for insects we get in the garden? Um, but there's a, a few of them out there. There's actually um, a couple books. Um, one of the, what, the books I have is actually Pests of the West. And I think if you click on the link also in the description or underneath my videos, there's uh, a link to the bookshop that lists all of my recommended books. And I think Pests of the West is in that. And um, uh, he's, he's actually a Colorado professor at Colorado State University. Um, his name just flew out of my head, the author of that. And he has a few books and I've seen other people recommend them as well. Um, that's one of the ones I use. Nowadays, I'm trying to learn more and more about some of the apps that we have on our phones that you can actually take pictures of, and the app will identify some of the pests as well. And I know some of you use that. Um, so if you've got any of those apps that you use, go ahead and share them with Masabi Gal right now as well, because uh, that's a great way to identify the pests real time. The Pests of the West is a book that I go to um, I think um, Bradley Crenshaw, not Crenshaw, Whitney Crenshaw. Whitney Crenshaw is the author of that. And I think he has another book that's like Pests of North America. Um, they haven't been in print for a while, so you might have some difficulty finding them. They were available the last time I checked on Amazon. But Whitney Crenshaw is an author I'm aware of that has some really good photo books. Uh, and one of his books is about the Western pests, and the other has some of the other pests in the garden. But check out some of those apps that some of you might be um, sharing right now. And that's a good way to get some of that information out there. Um, Vanessa Kennedy, what about good bugs, bad bugs? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I had that book in my school garden library. I actually don't have that in my home garden library. But good bugs, bad bugs has got some good pictures and some good information about the insects that you will encounter in your garden. So that's a good one. And Susan Mulvahill, yep, I'm aware um, that Susan's got some, some good information out there. So great, thanks for sharing all of that information. Um, lots of good information out there, it's just a matter of finding it. But once you find it, that's why I like having a garden library of actual books. And I, actually, I do keep a spreadsheet 
of websites. So when I find a good website, I'll put it on a spreadsheet categorized by whatever that topic happens to be. And then I've got the books in my library. And that's how I do a lot of my research and um, got to figure out what's going on in my garden is either by going back to a good website that I found or going to the good old books that I have and I can thumb through those. Laura Fry, thank you so much uh, for that question. Um, I will scroll up. Um, you can go ahead and put your question in the super chat, but let's see if I can find your question. Um, go ahead and repeat it right now, Laura, in case I can't find it as I stroll up and make sure you put at Gardner Scott in front of it. Um, but as I'm scrolling up, I'm not seeing your question. So go ahead and, and go ahead and repeat it if you would and put it on here again so I can see what that question is because um, I'd love to answer your question. Thanks for that super chat, but I didn't see it as I was scrolling up. So go ahead and please repeat it so that I can make sure that I give some answer to it. Um, Terry Carter's asking, anything you can do to soil to prevent squash borers? Yeah. Um, and that's what I was mentioning earlier. One of the things to prevent squash borers, that's an insect that's living in the soil and it's to disrupt their life cycle, to get in there, break apart that soil with a cultivator, turn over the soil as you're adding um, soil amendments. And that's a great way to disrupt their life cycle. Um, and that way, hopefully you won't have some issues with the squash borers in the, in the future. And then also, one, I've been learning more and more as well about soil and healthy fungi in the soil. And, and so if you've got a healthy soil with a lot of organic material in it, it'll attract some beneficial fungi in, a, in addition to beneficial bacteria that can also help deal with some of those insect pests that we have in the garden. So um, always good ways to, to just keep your soil healthy. So there's Laura. How many weeks sooner can I plant my cool weather crops with a cloche cover? Should I take the soil temperature to be sure? Um, good question. Yeah, if you can take the soil temperature, take the soil temperature. Soil temperature really needs to be, depending on the cool season plant, needs to be above 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees Celsius. That's That should be a minimum. Now, many cool season, cool weather plants can germinate below that. Spinach can actually germinate down to temperatures as low as freezing. Um, but you'll do better with warmer temperatures. So that's a, that's a good idea. I would put the cloche or whatever cover you're using in place for a day or two before you're planning on putting in your cool season um, plants, either seed or transplant. But taking a, a soil thermometer to get out there and see what the soil temperature is really a good idea to make sure that you're, you're doing it right. But um, the... Now, I, I have, a, again, a very cold region where we get some really cold temperatures into spring, which is why mid-May is when we have our last frost. With a cover, I will, will have success two weeks early with absolutely no issue. And so when I use a cloche or when I use a plastic cover over my beds, um, two weeks is is easy so i'll often start my garden on may 1st even though my last frost date is may 18th if you do both you can i would add another two weeks in front of that so i've actually used cloches underneath plastic cover on a hoop and started four weeks early and had no issues whatsoever but again i had those covers in place warming up the soil before i said put the seeds out in that particular bed and I have a video about using a wall of water system. If you've ever used wall of water, it's basically a little teepee around the plant that's filled with water. And I'll, I'll use the wall of water four weeks in advance as well because um, it's even uh, better than just a basic cloche cover. That water really creates a nice environment inside it. So a double protection, four weeks, a wall of water system, four weeks, other than that, just a basic single layer protection, I'll go two weeks early. So hope that helps out. Glad we can answer that question for you, Laura. And thanks for, for asking the question and giving the contribution. I really appreciate that. Um, so as we talk about all of this, <clears throat> I really want to, to 
to have you relax a little bit. And that, this is the, the philosophy word of the day is just relax. I'm in the middle of starting seeds. Many of you are in the middle of starting seeds. We've got lights, we've got soil, we got water, we got pests, we got the fungal issues, we've got the fungus gnats, we have all these issues that, that are adding stress to what we're doing in the garden. And like Jean-Pierre's question about if you can't plant it right now, can you wait a year? There's all of these things that, that are adding stress to our gardening lives. And I think gardening should be fun as much of the time as possible. So if you're confronting some of these, these issues, especially as a new gardener, and you're not sure if you have enough lights, you're not sure if your soil is, is right, you're not sure if you should have fertilizer or not, I just say relax. Try not to worry so much about it. One of the reasons I can give you the advice I can give you is because of all the mistakes I've made over the years because I didn't get the temperature right. I didn't get the, the timing right. I didn't have a seed starter mix and instead I used a potting soil and the seeds didn't do well. Uh, I didn't have a heat mat and so the peppers didn't do as well as I learned they would do later on. There's so many things that if you do it wrong, it's okay. If you don't get to it, it's okay. If you have a big plan for your garden this year, but you just didn't get to plant all the plants that you wanted to plant, it's okay. Enjoy what you have and try to focus on what you're doing and enjoy that. And, and I've already found myself doing it. I've, I've already found that I'm behind with some of the things that I wanted to do. And I've just already resolved myself to accepting that some of the herbs and some of the perennial flowers that I wanted to have in pots right now, it's not going to happen. I, I'm growing petunias from seed, and I was hoping to have some of my petunias flowering when I put them outside, just like the petunias you buy at the big box stores in spring. Well, my petunias are not going to be flowering by the time I had hoped I would be putting flowering petunias in the garden. Well, that's okay. I've got petunia plants. They'll flower. Last year, same kind of thing. I got a late start. The petunias I put out in my landscape were not flowering, but I got three distinct blooming periods from those petunias that I put outside. So you don't need to worry as much about it. Just relax. And, and I have the same issues. It's hard to relax when you want to do something, but try to really focus, get back to why you're gardening in the first place and why you're watching the videos and this live streams because you enjoy it. You want to learn more. You want to keep moving forward. If it becomes too stressful, it's just so easy to just not keep doing it. So keep doing it and don't get stressed. Just relax, enjoy it, learn a little bit, put some stuff in your journal, try some new things. If you can't get to it today, get to it next week. If you can't get to it next week, get to it next month. If you can't get to it next month, well, then maybe get to it next year. There are a few things that we're doing in gardening for enjoyment that are really time critical like that. And there's almost always another opportunity to do it. Now, if you're growing for food production, then yes, I understand that timing is more critical and growing all those plants is more critical because you, you want to get them out in your garden. You want them producing the food because you're planning on that. I get it, but you can still try not to be so stressed by the whole thing. If you're planning on growing a whole bunch of tomato plants to produce the food, even say you want to sell them or share them with your neighbors or your family and you just don't get as many as you would hope for, that's okay. Do better next year. You'll have learned this year about the timing and the transplanting and the care and all the rest of the factors that are involved. And that's, that's part of why those of us that have been doing this for a while get better at it because we've been doing it for a while and every year we learn that there's something new, something different that we need to do to make it more enjoyable and more successful the next season. And that's one reason why I like gardening so much is because I'm always looking to the next season as being better because there's always so many things that seem to go wrong in the current season. Some things we have control over, some things that we don't have control over, but it's always going to be better. So just try to keep focusing on that aspect of gardening where it's going to be better. 
you're going to have that opportunity to relax and enjoy what you're doing and you look back on the lessons you've learned now when things seem stressful and you're late getting your seed started or you wanted i had that happen this week as well i went ahead and ordered my seeds like i've been telling all of you to do i ordered my seeds well in advance they're going out for shipping and i had two different companies including baker creek that sent me an email saying sorry we're out of stock so they were in stock when i ordered them i was expecting those seeds as part of my garden plan and now i'm not going to get those seeds because the company that's sending them is out that happens so it just means that those specific plants that i had intended to grow this year i'm not going to grow this year oh well next year they'll be on my list i'll order them again i'll probably order them earlier next year and i'll still be able to grow the same plants i just have to wait a year and so patience is huge in gardening. And so if you're finding like me, and I know many of you have, that Baker Creek is closed down because they're getting so many orders, they shut down their website, you might not get what you want. Go someplace else. You stay, still may not get what you want. Try someplace else. And if you still don't get it, put it on next year's list. Don't worry about it this year. Find an alternative. A lot of the dollar stores in the United States have their seeds out right now. Pounce on that opportunity. I bought a bunch of those seeds this, this, this week. My daughter Kiri just went yesterday with her daughters. They bought a bunch of seeds. Four seed packages for a dollar. They may be cheap seeds, but they grow just as well. So have a fallback position. Just don't be stressed. If, if the, the primary plan doesn't work out, fall back to whatever option you have available and just keep gardening and just keep happy and just keep as stress-free as you possibly as you possibly can because there's so much in the world right now that stress us out that gardening should be the least stressful activity in your life and one way to do it is just to relax and enjoy the process and be flexible and have patience and it should all work out pretty well Kristen G, thank you so much for that contribution. I appreciate that super chat. It's always nice to have the support from all of you. And I do appreciate all the support from all of you. This has been a pretty productive period. There's been so much information popping back and forth. I'm so glad that I could help you out and all the other wonderful gardeners on this channel can help you out as well. And if you're new to the live stream, this is the first time, if you're watching on replay or first time that you're here live, we do this every Monday. And I will be back next Monday to do it all over again. So I hope to see you there next Monday, same time. We'll be covering a lot of more good gardening information. Tony's saying gardening is meant to, do, to de-stress you, not wind you up. And I completely agree. So in the time you have in the week ahead, go ahead and check out some of Tony's videos at Simplify Gardening. And go ahead and check out some of my videos here on the Gardner Scott channel. Keep learning all you can. And Nachi G, thank you so much for that super sticker as well. I appreciate you so much as I do everybody else. So I'll be here next Monday, same time, same channel. I hope you all are here as well. And we'll talk more global gardening. There you have it. Have a good gardening week. I'm Gardner Scott. Enjoy gardening.